Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons over on Patreon voted for South Carolina to be covered in my Statehood series. If you'd like to vote on which state will be covered next, please join the Patreon page for as little as $1 and cast your ballot. I'm doing something a little different with this Statehood video. Normally, I start with the creation of the area as a territory, covering the Native American history, and working my way up to Euro-American settlement. In this one, because it's one of the 13 original states, I am jumping right into the debates over ratification when these states were deciding whether to become states in this new union. Just after the Founding Fathers emerged from the Independence Hall with the new Constitution, a South Carolinian remarked, certain combinations which are now hatching against the establishment of the Federal Constitution, a swarm of paltry scribblers possessing posts of high emolument under the legislatures of the individual states, the confined tools and pensioners of foreign courts, and a certain description of men interested in securing a monopoly of our markets and carrying trade, are uniformly conspiring against the majesty of the people, and are at this moment fabricating the most traitorous productions which human depravity can devise. The South Carolinian distrusted what the men in Philadelphia planned for the new nation under a new federal constitution. Many men, especially in the upcountry of South Carolina, feared a centralized federal government. The Constitutional Convention ended in September 1787. South Carolina took up the question of whether to call for a convention to ratify the new federal constitution in January of 1788. One of the leaders of the opposition to the constitution was Rollins Lowndes. He held many positions in the South Carolina government, including governor, but feared an increase in federal power as the Constitution laid it out, as opposed to the Articles of Confederation. Anti-Federalists argued that the Articles of Confederation possess flaws, but the solution should be to repair them, not throw out the entire government. Lowndes asked his fellow legislators whether a man should be looked on as wise who possessing a magnificent fabric upon discovering a flaw, instead of repairing the injury, should pull it down and build another. Instead of repairs, the Federalists wanted to embark on an experiment in government, veering from time-tested political forms into uncharted waters. An experiment, exclaimed Lowndes, what risk the loss of our political existence on experiment? No, sir, if we are to make experiments, let them be such as may do good, but which cannot possibly do any injury to our own liberties or those of our posterity. Lowndes accused the South Carolina delegates to the Constitutional Convention of giving in to New England's economic wishes when it came to the Constitution and giving in to New England's demands by agreeing to end the African slave trade after 20 years. Charles Coatsworth Pinckney addressed Lowndes' concerns by stating, We have a security that the general government can never emancipate the slaves, for no such authority is granted. It is admitted on all hands that the general government has no powers but what are expressly granted by the Constitution, and that all rights not expressly granted are reserved to the states. We have obtained a right to recover our slaves in whatever part of America they may take refuge, which we had not before. In short, considering all circumstances, we have made the best terms for the security of this species of property that it was in our power to make. We would have done better if we could, but on the whole, I do not think them bad. The people of the northern states, Lowndes concluded, don't like our slaves because they have none themselves, and therefore want to exclude us from this great advantage. He objected to the potential tax on the importation of slaves, noting that the northerners will pay no such taxes. An impost will have to be paid, of course, but the price will be passed on to the consumer, which ultimately meant that the South would bear the burden. The concern over New England dominance did not end there. Upcountry and low country anti-federalists became concerned that New England's large populations doomed southern states from gaining any political power, even with the three-fifths compromise, which stipulated that three-fifths of a state's slave population counted toward its overall population in relation to how many representatives came from that state. The Federalists argued that the New England states had reached their population limits because of their small size and that South Carolina and the other southern states contained more land and thus more opportunity to become politically dominant in the Congress and Senate. So they may not have the population currently, 
but they would eventually get the political power they desired. The backcountry anti-federalists grew more concerned about the national bank that would restrict the money supply, making it harder for them to purchase on credit and making it more difficult for them to pay off their debts. One concern the anti-federalists put forward in the debate revolved around payment of congressmen and senators. This uneasiness harkened back to before the Revolutionary War, where instead of the individual colonies controlling the salary of the government officials, like the governor, Parliament paid their salary, giving the governors more incentive to go along with Parliament's plans rather than look out for the individual colonies. South Carolinians argued that the federal government paying congressmen and senators mirrored that atrocity perpetrated by England, and this would reduce the power of the states and make the representatives beholden to the federal government, not the states. The presidency scared the anti-federalists too. They believed the Constitution placed too much power in the president, and he could take one extra step and become king, the very thing they fought against just a few years prior. They threw up their hands at the idea that presidents would only come from the states with larger populations or a solidarity like New England. James Lincoln solemnly declared that the more he heard, the more he was persuaded of the Constitution's evil tendency. What does this proposed Constitution do, he asked? It changes, totally changes, the form of your present government from a well-digested, well-formed democratic. You are at once rushing into an aristocratic government. Ratification will put an end to liberty, for the power of government will be given into the hands of a set of men who live 1,000 miles distant from you. Let the people but once trust their liberties out of their own hands, and what will be the consequence? First, an haughty, imperious aristocracy, and ultimately, a tyrannic monarchy. Lowndes made one more effort to stem the tides setting so strongly toward the Constitution, and in his last speech praised the Confederation, declared that he had originally opposed the Declaration of Independence, but supported it when he found that it had the popular approval, and concluded with the expressed wish to have no other epitaph on his tomb than, Here lies the man who opposed the Constitution, because it was dangerous to the liberties of America. The debate in many ways was unnecessary. The Federalists held a majority in the legislature through a malapportionment favoring the Low Country, which remained heavily Federalist. After the heated debate between the legislature, they called for a vote to assemble a constitutional convention in Charleston. It barely passed with 76 yeas and 75 nays. They agreed to meet in May 1788 to debate ratification. There again, just like in the legislature, the Federalists held a majority, so no matter how convincing the anti-Federalist arguments were, it was nearly a foregone conclusion that South Carolina would ratify the Constitution. The Federalist majority called for an open debate on the floor, partially out of fear of an uprising in the backcountry that other states experienced. Just like in the legislature, the debate revolved around the possible corruption of senators, congressmen, and the president. Some anti-Federalists denounced the Constitution because the Senate was the only body that could impeach the president, and thus they could act as a shield against the president, acting as his cronies. They insisted that there must be another body to prosecute the president other than the Senate. They brought up again that Congress paying themselves created a cycle of corruption, and with no limit on how many terms they could serve, they could become perpetual tyrants. The Anti-Federalists also argued against the prohibition of religious tests for voting, which the Federalists supported. The article states, No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. The convention requested amendments to safeguard some rights, and they voted on proposals to be sent to the states for construction of Bill of Rights. As historian Michael Faber states in his book The Anti-Federalist Constitution, the only proposal brought forth by the committee that would require a change was that the clause concerning the oath of office should be changed to read no other religious tests, affirming that an oath is inherently religious. This amendment seems to have been the response to an especially impassioned speech by Reverend Francis Cummins, who was alarmed by the secular nature of the document and would have preferred to see the Constitution say that no religious denomination shall ever have preference to another in matters of state and all religious societies shall have equal liberty and protection. Inserting other was his second choice. 
when word got to the assembly that Maryland just a few days prior ratified the Constitution, many anti-federalists stood down from debate. As it appeared, the new proposed Constitution possessed great support from other states. The remaining anti-federalists attempted to propose an amendment that limited the president to serve a single term. Faber states, This proposal, after debate, elicited a roll call vote and lost 68 to 139. Next up was a proposal to prevent office holders from accepting any gift from foreign nations, removing the ability of Congress to grant exemptions. This also failed by voice vote. The Anti-Federalists made one more unsuccessful try to change the powers of Congress to deny the federal government the right to march a state militia out of the state without permission from the governor. After these three failed, the report of the committee was read, at which point John Bowman made one last effort, this time to establish a new committee to draw up a bill of rights to propose. When the Federalists would not agree even to this, the opposition knew its cause was lost and relented. The Constitution and the committee's unamended report passed 149 to 73. The Anti-Federalists had lost. It was nearly a foregone conclusion from the beginning, but they fought hard for their beliefs. In the end, even though they had been politically beaten, they made a vow to encourage their constituents to abide by the new constitution that would become law of the land. The Anti-Federalists stated they would exert themselves to the utmost of their abilities to induce the people quietly to receive and peaceably to live under the new government. As of May 23, 1788, one year after the Constitutional Convention began its construction of the new government, South Carolina became a member of the Union.